Okay, so <coughs> recording's going. Um, are, do you have any questions that you'd like answered from sections, I don't know, chapter five, I guess, sections one, two, three, four, or five? The homework for one through three was due Monday. Um, we've got a quiz on that this Friday. And then I posted the lecture videos for five, four, and five, five um, last week, and then another one Monday. That homework is due next Monday, the 19th. Um, and I've been saying this in every lecture for the last, in every lecture video for the last, uh, the last two times, I suppose, this last time, and then this time. We've got a test coming up next week. That is Thursday and Friday. It's just on chapters three to five. Um, so keep an eye out for a practice exam, and then I'll, I'll probably on Monday um, get around to making those solutions videos like I did last time. Okay. So, any questions about chapter five? Or if you've got questions about three and four, that's fine too. Otherwise, we'll just get started with section 5.4 questions. Okay, well, I'll keep an eye on the chat here, but I'm not seeing anyone jump up at that. So, I'll go ahead and get started with 5.4. Every time, I don't know if you can hear that. Every time, every Wednesday, I think my wife vacuums. <laughs> all right, here we go. So 5.4. 5.4 was all about graphing trig functions. Um, and so we've got uh, the other trig functions, I should say. Uh, graphing secant, cosecant, tangent, cotangent. Um, so they're, they're more or less the same as uh, graphing the other ones. Uh, you, you can make a nice little table uh, with some well-known values and in the lectures I give some hints as to which values which angles you should pick um, so first let's let's um, graph one of those so I've got a unit circle out here and let's let's look at something like the tangent function first so this will be question nine And then I'll do one that's a little more complicated next. So maybe I'll graph 28 next, and that'll be another tangent, but it'll be, um, it'll be more complicated. OK, so for number 9, we're asked to graph tangent of x, but this is going to be times 3. This is pretty vanilla. Um, just, just your normal tangent, but now it's times three. So um, with sine and cosine, you know, you, we've got these angles memorized, like the pi over six or the pi over three angle. And we've also got values memorized for pi over two. So in this first quadrant, hopefully you've got at least those angles memorized. But there's one other one, which is right in the middle, and that's pi over four. These are the angles for which you should have the sine and cosine values memorized. Uh, and as I explained in, in the lecture on 5.1, oh, excuse me, that's not pi, that's zero, pi. Um, pi is over here. Uh, as I explained in one of those earlier lectures, memorizing the trig values for these angles that I've shown here uh, really 
is really, really beneficial because then it gives you the ability to know these trig angles all over here just because of the symmetries in the circle. So memorizing these values is really, really, really helpful, especially for graphing something like a tangent or cotangent or secant or cosecant function. So what I suggest in the lecture video with tangent is to use an angle, specifically this one, which is really, really nice for tangent. So why is, and this is a question for you that you can answer, why is pi over 4, when making a table of values for helping graph tangent, why is the angle pi over 4 a great choice for tangent? We could, we could, you know, we could easily pick pi over six, pi over three, but why is pi over four probably the first angle you should go for when trying to graph tangent x? Right, the tangent is one, and why is it one, Jacob? Because it's because the, the cosine and sine are both radical two radical two over two. Perfect. See he's got those memorized. You're right up you're right there, man. You're like you're at par. <laughs> you're doing great. Uh, yeah, sine and cosine are equal. Okay, so if you if you wanted to compute tangent of pi over six, it's just a little more work because sine and cosine are not equal. Right? The sine is one half, the cosine is root three over two. So then you have to take the fraction of those. And that means you're simplifying a compound fraction, which is a little bit more difficult, but you can do it. Okay, so so this is what I say in the lecture videos. To, with tangent, try and shoot for an angle of pi over four. Uh, and I'll show you how to do that in 28, where it's a little more complicated, but that's the goal. We're trying to hit this pi over four angle. Um, how about this one? Negative pi over four. That's this angle down here. What's the tangent value there? And then the next questions will be about these two over here. Once you find an easy angle, like pi over 4, the next step when graphing these things is to look for all the other angles which have the same reference number, pi over 4. So we're looking at negative pi over 4. We're looking at 3 pi over 4. We're looking at 5 pi over 4. All of these have a reference number or angle of pi over 4. So what's this one? Negative pi over 4. Negative 1. Perfect. Yep. Because it, it has the same reference number, because of that, it means that the absolute value of the x and the y coordinates are equal. Right? So pi over 4 has x and y coordinates that are equal. So if you pick any other angle which has the same reference angle, the absolute value of those x and y coordinates will also be equal. Which means the tangent is either going to be 1 or negative 1 because it's the ratio of those two. So at negative pi over 4, one of those two is negative. In fact, the y coordinate is negative, and the x is positive. So we get negative 1 here. How about 3 pi over 4? It's going to be 1 or negative 1. Which one is it? And then the next one is 5 pi over 4. Thank you for putting a, 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 an answer out there, Mariah. Think again for 3 pi over 4. Look at where this point is. It's above the y-axis, which means the y-coordinate is positive. But then here's the origin. 
is to the left of the origin, which means a negative x coordinate and a positive y coordinate, which means negative 1. Okay, thank you for thank you for trying though. But maybe you can answer this one. For 5 pi over 4, it's going to have the same x coordinate that's negative. But now the y coordinate is going to be negative. So that, as Romung says, is positive 1. Okay? All right. So, this is tangent of x. So what is 3 tangent of x? Well, it's just 3 times these things. And this is what we're trying to graph. So 3, negative 3, 3, negative 3, 3. Okay, I'm just going to slide this over a little bit and smash it down a little bit. I missed a negative sign somewhere. Where'd it go? Right there. Okay. So now we'll go ahead and start plotting. So what have we found? We found so far, um, I'll put pi right there, 2 pi there. negative pi, negative 2 pi. We found so far that pi over 4, so I take this interval and I split it up into four pieces, pi over 4 is right here. We found that at pi over 4 we have a value of 3. So plot this perhaps in blue. And at uh, 3 pi over 4, which is right here, that's 3 fourths of pi, we're at negative 3. And at 3 pi, I just did that one at negative pi over 4, so I take this interval and I split it into four parts. So this, this one right here is negative pi over 4. It's a fourth of pi. We've got a value of negative 3. And at 5 pi over 4, which is right here, I take this next interval and split it up into four parts. And we've got 1, 2, 3, 4, 5 fourths of pi. So right here, 5 pi over 4, we're at a value of 3 again. Okay, so what are some other really, really easy angles for tangent? Ones where the ratio of sine and cosine involves very, very simple things that are not fractions. <laughs> what are some other values that for tangent you should try and put in your table? So if we think about this, and we think about the things that we have memorized, sine and cosine, so what are the what are the x and y coordinates for these things? Jacob said earlier this one's root 2 over 2 for both, and he's right. At 0, sine is 0, and cosine is 1. That's a pretty easy thing to take the ratio of. 1 and 0. At pi over 2 we also have excuse me I, I misplaced those. I for some reason for some reason I keep doing this. 1 0. Uh, at, up at pi over 2 <clears throat> we also have a nice easy pair to take a ratio of 0 and 1. 
at these ones, pi over 3 and pi over 6, we don't have a nice easy pairs to take ratios of. It gets a little bit messy. So here we've got root 3 over 2 for cosine and 1 half for sine. And here they're just switched. We've got a cosine of 1 half and a y value of root 3 over 2. Which of these would be nice, easy things to take ratios of? I, I, I suggest angle 0 and angle pi over 2. So let's add those to our list. If we have an angle of 0, if we have an angle of pi over 2, or any multiple of pi over 2. Right, so we can keep going. Pi, we can go 3 pi over 2. We can go to 2 pi. We can go in the negative direction as well. So let's start with 0. Tangent of 0 is the ratio of the sine divided by the cosine. So that's 0 over 1. Well, that's 0. And 3 times 0 is still 0. How about pi over 2? Tangent is 1 over 0. Well, that's undefined. We don't know what 1 divided by 0 is. How about at pi? At pi, what's the, what are the coordinates? We've got negative 1, 0 for the coordinates of that point. So this is negative or 0 over negative 1, which is 0. So 3 times 0 is still 0. At 3 pi over 2, we're still going to get an undefined value. It's going to be negative 1. We're down here. So negative 0 comma negative 1. That's still undefined. Okay, so for sine and cosine, remember, I, I suggested picking angles that were nice, and those angles that were nice were these values, the pi over 2 and 0 angles and then also the pi over 3 and pi over 6 angles, depending on which one you're graphing. For cosine, it was the pi over 3. For sine, it was the pi over 6. So these are like the common angles that you use to graph those functions. For tangent, it's different. You keep the pi over 2 and the 0 angles, but you don't use the pi over 3 or pi over 6 angles. For ease, you use the pi over 4 angle. So now let's plot these new ones that we've got and see what we get. So at an angle of 0, we're right here at 0. At an angle of pi over 2, that's this angle right here, we've got an undefined value. So I'll come back to that. At pi, we're at 0. And we start seeing this, this pattern. 1, 2, 3. 1, 2, 3. It's going to keep going forever and for always like that. So at every multiple of pi, we're going to have 0. And every pi over 4 below that, we're going to be at negative 3. For every pi over 4 above that, we'll be at 3. So 0, 3, negative 3. And it's just going to keep going. So dot, 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 dot. So what happens at these undefined values? Well, in the lecture, I talk about how these are actually asymptotes. There are these imaginary lines that are vertical that the graph gets closer and closer to okay and they, and they keep going as well in this nice pattern Let's draw one over here as well these aren't actually part of the graph but they're, they're sort of just these imaginary lines, these imaginary boundaries. Um, you've seen asymptotes before in this course, so I, I don't need to talk about it too much. But basically what happens in each of these little sections is the same thing. The tangent graph kind of looks like an x cubed, where it comes up from below, levels out at the middle point, and then climbs back up. And the closer that you get to this vertical line, it's like the closer 
in the x coordinate that you get to that vertical line, the closer you get up here and the higher you go. So it shoots off to infinity there. In the other direction, the closer you approach this left asymptote, the further down your graph goes and the closer it gets to this extension of this orange line. Okay. And the tangent graph is this basic thing repeated over and over again. So it just comes up very quickly, levels out in the middle, and then shoots up to infinity like that. It just repeats itself over and over and over again. Now I know that it looks like this because I've plotted these things hundreds of times. Um, but I do remember, I still remember when I was first learning these things, um, I did not make such a bare bones table. Right, I plugged in, what, like pi over four, multiples of pi over four, and then I plugged in zero and multiples of pi, essentially, like that's very few points. I still remember when I was younger, experimenting that with these angles and seeing what this curve looks like here and what happens here, for example. But, you know, you do that once or twice and, and it's like, you know, why would you continue to do that? Because you know what it looks like. You've done it once or twice. In this, in this course for the test, for quizzes, for things, I'm not asking for a perfect graph anyway. So you plot like seven points and you're good because you know the pattern, you just fill it in, okay? So, so long as you know, you're able to compute a basic table like this and what I erased earlier, you're good. That should be enough. Um, because no matter how complicated the tangent function looks, here we've just got three tangent x, no matter how complicated it looks, you, sh you should still be able to um, graph it based on the general pattern you have memorized. Okay, so some, some additional questions about this. What's the period of this tangent graph that we we just did. So what is the period of 3 tangent of x? Yep, so we're, we're just looking at how wide is this interval. And this angle here is negative pi over 2. And this, in, uh, and this value here is pi over 2. So in total, that's pi. So we didn't adjust the period at all. This is the normal period for tangent. It's pi. OK, follow-up question. What is the amplitude of 3 tangent of x? Okay, good. <laughs> good. Your sil your stunned silence is like it's good. What is the what is the amplitude of, of sine and cosine? Amplitude refers to like wave height. This this doesn't even look like a wave. But I just wanted to get at something that I said in the lecture videos. This number, if it's in front of a sine or a cosine, if you take the absolute value of that number, that's the amplitude. So oftentimes students will say, you know, that number when I ask that question, but none of you, none of you said it, which means all of you understand that the tangent doesn't really have an amplitude. But what does this three do to our graph? What effect is it having on the normal tangent graph? So I guess I'll type it out here. How is 3 tangent of x different than tangent of x?
That's my specific question for you. And if you look at this table that we've got here, I'm asking what's the difference between this and this, this and this, because I've got tangent of x and three tangent of x graphed here, or pl uh, in the table here. For these values, there is no difference. So the normal tangent graph is incident with our three tangent of x graph. What about at the other values? If you just look at the chat, you can see what tangent was. Tangent was either 1 or negative 1, depending on which angle we plugged in. So I've got those points plotted now. So the original tangent graph is below this or above this depending on which which side you're looking at. The original tangent graph is just a little bit a little bit more squashed. It's a little flatter in that middle section. It does not increase as rapidly as 3 tangent of x does. We're stretching it vertically. Right? That's the general idea. If you take a function and you multiply it by a number bigger than 1, you're stretching it vertically. If you multiply it by a number between 0 and 1, you're squishing it right you're you're compressing it vertically okay let's go to 28 unless there's questions are there any questions on this okay anyone else no questions Twenty-eight is the next one, and I'm not going to do the whole thing because just doing one of these questions takes a long time, as you saw in that last one. So I'm going to set it up for you, and then I will suggest that you run with it um, after class, or just think about how we can, how you would do it. So twenty-eight says to graph and find the period of. 2 tangent of and here's why here's where it's more difficult than the other one it's 2 tangent of pi over 2 x okay so i suggested in the last one that we look for angles of 0 and pi over 2 and pi over 4. When you're graphing a tangent, these are the ones that you want to aim for. And I, I used my words carefully because in this question we can't just plug them in. We need to aim for them. <laughs> We need to try and pick x values that give us these nice values. So 
here's our x, here's our pi over 2x, and here's our tangent of pi over 2x. And I'm just going to make a table of these. And I'm, I'm actually not going to plot them because that's something that you could do with this table. So I guess I will erase this. So here we go. We want, we want this to be pi over 4. We want this to be 0. We want this to be pi over 2. Because these are the easy things to plug into tangent. Because if we can get those plugged into tangent, we know exactly what we're going to get. Pi over 4, we're going to get 1. Right? If we plug in pi over 4 here, we're going to get 1. If we plug in 0 here, what do we get? We get You should have this memorized. Let's see. Tangent of 0 is We think about the coordinates here. What's the coordinate of this point? Great. Yes, the coordinate is 1, 0. Tangent of that is 0. Pi over 2. What do we get for tangent of pi over 2? We think about this point. We think about its coordinate. Then we think about the ratio. It's going to be 1 over 0, so it'll be undefined. Okay. So the whole point of this question 28 is that we can't just plug in pi over 4, 0, and pi over 2. But that's what we're aiming for. So the question is, what x do we plug in? What x do we plug in here? We'll go, go start with this one. In order to get pi over 2 times x to equal pi over 4. What x do we plug in so that when we multiply by pi over 2, we get pi over 4? What is that input? If you want, you can write it out as an equation for each one of these. x times pi over 2 equals, and in this case it's just pi over 4. So what does x need to be? Let's try pi over 2. Let's see. Thank you, James. So let's let's do pi over 2 times pi over 2. That gives us pi squared, right, over 4. So that's close, James, very close. You can see what went wrong. We don't want this squared, which means we need to get rid of this pi, and we need to use Saria's answer of 1 half. Very good, Saria, very good, James. Thank you for, for stepping out there. Let's go to the next one. It's the same basic question. X times pi over two equals zero. What do we need to plug in? This is the easiest one. It's, uh, yep, it's definitely zero. Okay, let's go to the next one. This one's the second easiest one. A number times pi over 2 is pi over 2. What's the number? <laughs> it's obviously 1, right? Yep. Okay. I started with the hardest one. Sorry. Sorry. So I said I wasn't going to graph it, but I, th I think I might need to. So uh, 
Um, there's some nice symmetry is going on here if we think about what's happening for angles like negative pi over 4 right and negative pi over 2 um, what do we need to plug in for x in order to get this negative pi over 4 well that's negative 1 half what do we need to plug in to get negative pi over 2 well that's negative 1 so on our graph I'm gonna do this here's negative 1 here's negative 1 half here's 1 half and here's 1 we know that our graph which is now I'll actually write it in 2 tangent of pi over 2x will give us a value of 2 here still a 0 still an undefined here at negative 1 half we'll have negative 2 we can just think about why that's true. The x coordinate is going to be the same, but the y coordinate is going to be the opposite of the x coordinate for this angle, which gives us the same ratio but with the opposite sign. And then at negative 1, we're going to have again an undefined. So we're going to have these vertical asymptotes like this at 1 and negative 1. At 0 we have a value of 0. At 1 half we have a value of 2. And at negative 1 half we have a value of negative 2. So our graph roughly looks like this. Looks the same, right? Looks more or less the same. It's the same general shape, which is why I said in the last one, in the last example, you know, once you do a few of these, you, you basically know what's going on. You just need to plug in a few points to get a handle for, you know, how squished together this is horizontally or how squished it is vertically or how stretched out, I guess, in the opposite sense as well which we did. Normally, this value is not 1 for tangent. Normally, it's pi over 2, which is definitely not equal to 1. Normally, this value is pi over 4, but not in this case. So we just had to sort of look at what we had, and we needed to look at how can we achieve those target angles with our inputs. That's the hardest thing about graphing these these functions is figuring out what to plug in to achieve your nice easy target angles. Okay, questions on how I did that? Any questions on any of that there? If not, I'll go ahead and move on. Oh, but first I, I need to ask a question. What is the period of this graph? Anyone? What's the period of this graph that we've got going on here? Thank you, Ashley. Yeah. Yeah. That's exactly it. Yeah, exactly, Shingy. Exactly. We're just we're just asking ourselves, you know, what is this what is the length of this interval right here? 
because the tangent graph is it's going to repeat itself again over here. It's going to repeat itself again over here. So what is the length of the interval in which one repeating pattern is is graphed? And that answer is 2 for this one. It goes down to negative 1 and up to 1. The total length of that is 2. Uh, in the in the lecture I give a nice little formula for this. I think it was it A or maybe it was K. I don't remember what the variable was. So when you've got tangent of k times x, and that's what you're trying to graph. The period is always equal to pi, that's the original period of tangent, divided by k. For us, that's pi over 2. So we've got pi divided by pi over 2. And if you simplify that, the pi's cancel out, the 2 comes up on top to give you just 2. Okay. All right. I'm going to go ahead and move on. Uh, we've spent 40-ish minutes on this section, 5.4. The next section is on inverse sine and inverse cosine. Excuse me. Inverse functions just in general. Uh, I'd like to get into those because this 5.4 is just about graphing these things. Um, and it's, it's, it's well explained and exampled in the lectures. And here I, I went through a more complicated one. Uh, so I, I suppose now it's all well exampled. But I can do another one here if you want. What are your preferences? Do another one of these or move on to the inverse trig functions? One vote for move on. Two votes for move on. All right, we're moving on. Okay, so 5.5. Um, if you weren't speaking up and you wanted me to say, uh, maybe find a, a specific example that you want me to do and I can do it at a later time and make a video of it. But for 5.5, uh, so we're talking about inverse functions now. And so just to quickly give an example in general, uh, trig functions or these circular functions take us to, they take us from an angle. So if I give you an angle T, they take this angle and they give you a coordinate. So these are the trig functions T. So I'll just, I'll just write the word, trig function. So this is typically what they do, right? So what does an inverse trig function do? An inverse trig function goes in the other direction. So it takes a coordinate, like an x or a y coordinate, or it takes a ratio in the case of tangent, which is the ratio of the y over the x coordinates, and it goes back to an angle. So this is the inverse trig functions. Okay. And as I explained in the lecture, this is not as easy as it as it could be. Let's just look at one specific example of just the sine function. The sine function looks like this. It just keeps going forever and forever. If I, if I ask for the angle, which gives you, say, this y coordinate of 1 half, which angle would you give me? That's, that's kind of the, the big question of this section. If I have sine of x as my initial function, and I want to know, you know, here's one half. If I, I want to know which angle over here, which angle gives me a one half, what would you say? Which angle would you give me? We 
can think about the unit circle if we need to. So here's the first quadrant. So one half is right about here. So I'm just going to draw straight over. So there's my terminal point. This will maybe help you estimate this angle or think about this angle. What angle here would you say is the angle which gave me one half? Oh, come on, people, come on. I know you got this. What angle, sign of what angle is one half? So I'm just going to hope going to hope that people just aren't here <laughs> listening. I'm going to hope. <laughs> Thank you, Jacob. Thank you, Briar. Thank you, James. <laughs> I, was like, I was like, it's like, surely they know this. They have it memorized at this point because I've said it so many times. Yeah, it's pi over six. It's pi over six. Very good. Is that the only one? So when, when I plot that here, that's pi over six. That's definitely not the only one. All right, what about this angle? That's 13 pi over six. What about this angle? Right here. That's five pi over six. See, the whole crux of this this section 5.5 5. Uh, 5 .5 is that as we've graphed this, we do not have an inverse function. We have an inverse for sure. What is the sine inverse of 1 half? That was the question I just asked. Well, it turns out it's actually it's actually any one of these infinite number of angles so there, there's just there's an infinite list of them so instead of being just one thing we have an infinite list of possible angles all of which when you take the sign of them you just get one half and so I can I can list them out it's pi over 6 plus 2 pi times any any integer n or it's 5 pi over 6 plus 2 pi times any integer n it's an infinitely long list of things the sine inverse is a huge list and it's just as big as the integers are So you know your definition of a function. You can't have, for one input, an infinite list of outputs. We need to boil it down to just one. So which one should you pick? Well, it turns out in the lecture, I say this is probably the best choice or one of the better choices. It turns out if you look at just this portion of sine, which I'm highlighting now, that's from pi over 2 down to negative pi over 2. Turns out if you just look at those portions, if you limit your angles to just those, for any one possible input to the sine inverse, there's only ever one possible output. So the sine inverse has a domain of negative 1 to 1, but it has a range 
of negative pi over 2 to pi over 2. So I gave several examples for this in the lecture. And I'm going to put one question up now for you, if I can find it. Okay. So the question that's up right now is, what is, and here I say arc sine. Arc sine is just another way of saying sine inverse of one. Okay, what is arc sine of one? Uh, again, that's the same as sine inverse. So as I, as I showed earlier, this is up as a poll right now, but I'll talk while you're thinking. Um, as I was just saying, there is actually an infinite list of possible angles here. Right, so here's our height one. What angles achieve that height one? Well, there's an infinite list of them. Which one do we pick? That's the, that's the bigger question. And I highlighted the section that we should be using. We should only be using angles in here. So what is your, what's your answer here? Go ahead and throw it into the poll. I'll give you, oh, another 45 seconds. We've got 13 out of 18, 18 people showed up. All right, great. Still waiting on five people. Still waiting on four people now. Great job. Still waiting on three people. So what is the arc sine? What is the sine inverse of one? So far the answers are pretty well spread out. That's okay. We're at 16 of 18. Okay, so I'll give you another 30 seconds to throw your answer in, even if you don't get it, even if you don't know it. That's fine, just throw an answer in there. Okay, about 15 seconds left. If you don't have an answer in, just throw it in to let me know you're here. Share the results here. Looks like nine of you got it right. That's great. So when we look at this, the graph is, is accurately portraying this. This angle here is the one that gives us the height of one. And I've even I've even listed that. It's pi over two. If we think about the unit circle up here, we're looking at this arc sine, which means we're asking which angle has a y coordinate, because we're dealing with sine here, which angle has a y coordinate of one? Well, it's this angle right here that goes all the way up, and that's pi over two. Okay, for those of you that answered one, um, sort of a sort of a tricky, question here uh, you you can get uh, you can get ones back out sometimes with sine inverse uh, but the input is really kind of really kind of messy so usually I say usually um, in a in a trig class or in a pre-calc class usually inverses of trig functions have a, a pi in them like usually uh, just because nice angles are often selected and nice angles are selected 
with pies in them because they're whole whole fractions of pi, like pi over two, pi over three, pi over four, over six, what have you. Usually there's a pi in them. In the real world, all of these are decimals, so like no one, no, a one is a completely valid answer. So uh, let's see, for those of you that said negative pi over two, negative pi over two is down here. So that's got a y coordinate of negative one. That goes down like this, okay? Uh, pi and negative pi, both of those go halfway around. Here's negative pi and here's pi. Both those go halfway around the circle to end at this point, which is at the coordinate negative one, zero. So the sign is actually zero, okay? Here we're looking for the angle that has a sign of one, not a sign of zero. Um, but you probably made the same mistake that I so often do. I switch the x and the y coordinates, right? I so often will graph this as like zero, one. <laughs> <laughs> and that's totally, totally wrong. All right. Someday when I grow up, I'll, uh, I'll not switch those around. Okay, so good job on that poll. Got another one for you. I know it's like two right away in a row, but here you go. What is, if you can't see it here, the next question is, what is arc sine or sine inverse of two. That's the next question. The poll is up. You can go ahead and start throwing your answers in. Okay, we're a minute in. We got about seven, eight people now. Well done. I'll give you at least another minute to keep thinking and then throw your answer in. We've got about another 30 seconds, and there's 12 of you have thrown your answers in. Still waiting on six, so keep thinking. two minutes in, 15 out of 18 of you have answered. So we're thinking about arc sine of two. So we're thinking about the angle that ends at a terminal point with a y coordinate of two on the unit circle. What angle does that? I'll give you another 30 seconds to think and throw an answer in even if you don't know. So another 30 seconds. Well, now, now about 20 seconds. Okay, about 10 seconds. Just throw an answer in at this point if you don't have it, either in the chat or uh, over in the polls. Okay. So the majority of you again answered correctly. So seven of you said it does not exist. Would any of you care to explain why it doesn't exist?
That's fine. I can explain. That's why I'm here. So we're looking for the angle, which has a y coordinate of 2 at its terminal point. So let's, let's think about the unit circle. Where is the y coordinate the biggest? That's going to be up here, right? And because that, that's as high up on the unit circle as we can go. We can't go any higher than that point. This is the unit circle, which means it has a radius of 1. So this height is 1. And we are asking which angle gives us a height of 2. The answer is no angle. No angle does that. Right? This point up top has a y coordinate of 1. There's, there's no way that gets stretched out to 2 with just a sine function. It could happen with a tangent or a cotangent or a secant or a cosecant. It's not happening with a sine. It's not happening with a cosine. Because we're only looking at the y coordinate with sine. And with x, we're looking right with some cosines, we're looking at the x. And the x and y coordinates never exceed 1. So this gets at the domain for the sine inverse and the cosine inverse. We can only plug in numbers between negative 1 and 1. If we plug in anything outside of that little interval, then the answer right away is there is no such thing. There is no such angle. Okay, so for those of you that said pi over two or negative pi over two, th those are those are good efforts. You know, you're thinking about where sine is biggest or smallest. Um, good efforts. Pi and negative pi, again, that that's all the way over here, and the y coordinate is going to be zero. Right, definitely not two. And okay, so so here just does not exist. And everybody took my hint, at least, that there's probably going to be a pi somewhere in the answer, <laughs> if there is an answer. So, so good. None of you answered 0, 2, or negative 2. All right. OK. We've got plenty of time. We can get through lots more of this stuff. Here we go. Um, I, I guess just to make things easy for a time being, I will ask uh, one more question about sine, and then I'll get into a different one. So I can erase this, I guess. And as I'm writing this down, uh, let me just reiterate that this section should really suggest to you that it is really important to have memorized the, the things that I've asked you to memorize for this trig unit, I guess, of study. Right, there's certain angles you should just know the sine values for and the cosine values for. If I were to ask you this question right here, which I've written on the screen, on a test, you should look at it for like all of half a second and know the answer. Okay, like these these questions are literally, have you memorized this or not? Because if you haven't, you're I don't think you're going to. I don't think you're going to be able to answer a question maybe like this. This one you might be able to answer by figuring it out in like a minute or two or three, but it's still going to take like a hundred times longer than it should. Okay, so these, you, you don't have to have it memorized now, but that answering this should take all of about two seconds. Okay. All right, so first one, this is question four. What's the sine inverse of negative one? So we're still dealing with sine. 
which means we're still looking for the angle between negative pi over 2 and pi over 2. So that's these angles on the unit circle. We're looking for the angle, which has a y coordinate of negative 1. The y coordinate because we're, we're dealing with sine still. So which angle gives us that? Somebody's got to have it. What do we think for this first one? What is the arc sine of negative 1? Perfect. Very good, Mariah. Yep. We want to go this way, so it's in the negative direction and we want to go all the way down, which is negative pi over 2. Very good. Okay, next one. Root 2 over 2. What angle between pi over 2 and negative pi over 2 gives us root 2 over 2 for the y coordinate? Pi over 4. Very good. We've dealt with that earlier today. Very good. And how about arc sine of negative 2? What angle gives us a y coordinate of negative 2? Very good. That There is none. There's, there's it's not applicable. Like no angle gives us a y coordinate of negative 2. That's like down here on the unit circle, right? It's like all the way down here. That's off the unit circle. No angle does that. Okay, so that's sine. Very good. Going to keep the same numbers here. I'm just going to switch to cosine. Same type of question. But instead of dealing with sine now, we're dealing with cosine which means one thing has changed. I'll erase the graph, because that's obviously completely different. But to answer this question, only one thing has changed. Instead of asking which angle gives us a y coordinate of negative 1, or root 2 over 2, or negative 2, we're now asking the question, what angle gives us the x coordinate of negative 1? or root 2 over 2, or negative 2. Now, that might seem fishy already for this first one. Because there's no angles in between negative pi over 2 and pi over 2, which give us a coordinate of negative 1 in the x location. That's because when you when you do this process that we did before, when we where we looked at sine and we saw there's a repeating portion that starts at negative pi over two and goes to pi over two, that's a one to one portion. Uh, so we're going to pick that as like our principal domain. Um, when we do that same thing for cosine, what we pick is the angles between zero and pi. 
Okay, so if I were to graph cosine again, oops, well that's fine, whatever. If we graphed cosine, looks more or less like this, and keeps going, repeating forever. If we asked again, what angle gives us this height? Well, there's lots of them. This angle, this angle, there's another one right here. There's another one right here. There's an infinite list. So we need to restrict ourselves to a certain portion of this graph. And the typical portion that is chosen is from here down to here. That's from zero to pi. There's no repeated values in that one and it covers the full range, negative one to one. So that's what I've highlighted up here. When you answer questions about cosine inverses, you should only ever give angles between zero and pi. Okay, so now, now that we've seen that, what are we gonna answer for these? The first one's asking which angle between zero and pi has an x coordinate equal to negative one. Well, it's listed right here, it's pi. Okay, next one. Which angle between zero and pi has an x coordinate of root two over two? And again, it's pi over four, very good. This is exactly how fast it should be just in general. Okay, which angle between zero and pi has an x-coordinate of negative 2. Don't think too hard. It's just like the sine one. None of them. Literally none. Does not exist. We, we can only get an x-coordinate as little as negative 1. We cannot go as little as negative 2. Okay, very good. So, so when you're working with cosine inverse, it's basically the same as working with sine inverse, except you're answering, you know, in terms of x coordinates. With sine inverse, you're looking for the angle that gives you a y coordinate. With cosine inverse, you're looking for the angle which gives you an x coordinate. And there's a little bit of a shift of the angles that are possible. Um, instead of talking about pi over two down to negative pi over two, you're dealing with angles from zero up to pi. Okay, so now, We'll switch and give you a little more repetition. And I'm gonna throw a curveball at you. So this is question nine. Cosine inverse of negative one half. Sine inverse of negative root two over two. And here comes the curve ball, tangent inverse of one. I haven't even explained tangent, but it's the same general idea. So question 9a, what angle between zero and pi gives us an x coordinate of negative one half? And again, just to give honest expectations, uh, these first two, even this third one, these are ones that by test time, you should just you should just know them, right? These are just ones that you should have worked with enough that it's just right there. This would take all of two seconds to look at and know the answers and, and another five seconds to write them down. So if this were a positive one half, what would your angle be? If this were a positive one half, what would your angle be? Well, one half is right about here. So I'll go straight up. And that gives you an idea of what this angle looks like.
we're dealing with negative one half, which means the angle is very similar. It's just right here. And if I sort of completed this top circle, it gives you a really, really suggestive picture of what this angle is. So we're dealing with negative one half. The, the picture suggests exactly what it, it should be. Not three pi over four. Ha, th this this whole half circle is pi, right? And how many how many divisions have I put into it? I've got one, two, three divisions, and they look pretty equal, don't they? They look really equal. It's because they are equal. So how many thirds have I gone through to get this one? Two of them. This is two thirds of pi. But thank you though, Briar. Yes, if this were if this were split into fourths and we had gone through three of them, it would be three pi over four but this is split into thirds. Okay. This sort of geometric reasoning through it, it's a really good tool as you're learning this to, to really draw that unit circle out and think about uh, really even equal slices of the pie, <laughs> like both mathematical and the picture. <laughs> nice even equal slices of the pie. What fraction of the pi have you gone through? Okay. All right, how about for the next one? Um, maybe that's the one you were answering, Briar. For the next one, we're dealing with a y coordinate very good. A y coordinate that is negative root 2 over 2. Well, pi over 4 gives us a y coordinate of positive root 2 over 2. So that means that negative pi over 4 gives us the negative root 2 over 2. So that's that's that. Done. Check. Okay, and tangent inverse of 1. Here's the hard one. What angle? I haven't talked about the range of tangent at all, but what angle it gives us a tangent value of one? If you're taking notes, you can look back at our previous graph of tangent and remember that it looks like this. and then it repeats itself over and over and over again, right? So you're looking for the angle that's in the centermost portion of tangent. The centermost. Which means it has to be between what two values? It needs to be between negative pi over two and pi over two, right? Don't pick anything outside of that. So this one, to answer this one, you're, uh, you're asking yourself the question, what angle between negative pi over two and pi over two, that's, that's the limits of this, um, of this branch of tangent. There's asymptotes at pi over 2 and pi over, uh, negative pi over 2. And there's a central most portion of tangent. It just repeats over and over again. You're looking for the angle in that region, so negative pi over 2 to pi over 2, that gives you a ratio of sine to cosine of 1. And Mariah's got it. That's where they're equal. And that's at pi over 4. Very good.
Okay, so now I've done a couple of those questions and I'm over time, but most of these questions from 5.5, just to sort of summarize it all, um, they really should just be like that, right? You, you should have, like as I look at this section of problems at the end of 5.5, I don't think there's anything up till, set, up till question 10 uh, definitely not questions 11 through um, 11 through 22 because those are all calculator questions there's nothing through 10 skipping 11 to 22 there's nothing through 23 to the end 48 that you shouldn't just have memorized because you need to memorize those pairs of numbers for three angles two of which have the exact same numbers in the different coordinate locations, and one of them is literally the same number twice. So there's a total of three numbers that you should have memorized and then associated with the angles in the first quadrant. Um, so these questions in 5.5, they're just recall questions. They're just, hey, do you have it memorized? Hey, do you have that one memorized? Um, you should just you should be able to just boom 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 get through them fast, okay? Um, I think it was a couple of videos ago. Take some time. I said this a couple of videos ago. Take some time to make that table: sine, cosine, tangent. Put a bunch of angles down here: zero, pi over six, pi over four, pi over three, pi over two and just make this list. Do it the, however many times it takes. Just fill this out. And then once you've got that memorized, put in cosecant, put in secant, put in cotangent. Okay, make the whole table. Do it 10 times. It, it won't take you very long uh, to get these numbers down. Because if you do have them down, 5.5 will just be whew, super fast. But I'm four minutes over, and I don't want to keep taking your time. So thank you for coming today. It's good to see all of you. Good to hear from more of you today. Enjoy your weekend as well. Uh, if you have any questions about the homework uh, or the quiz uh, sections 5, 1 to 3, uh, let me know. Shoot me an email, and I'll get back to you as soon as I can, okay? All right. Have a great day, everyone.